What a great job. What a great sense of God in the house this morning. Come on, we're going to pray. Who's ready for a word from God today? And uh, what a wonderful time to be here. Happy birthday also, Pastor Mark, 60 years old. He doesn't look it, does he? <laughs> I've got more grey hairs than what you've got. These are, the, these are the COVID-produced gray hairs. Come, we're going to pray. Father, we thank you today for your presence. The Holy Spirit, we thank you today for your anointing. God, I pray as we look at your word today, we thank you, Father, that your word is sharper than a double-edged sword. We thank you, Lord Jesus, today you're going to speak to us, God. You're going to open up our hearts. You're going to open up our ears. And Holy Spirit, you're going to minister to us today out of your word in your wonderful name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. I want to talk to you today on breaking through fear. I think we are living in a pandemic of fear. With all the stuff that's going around in the world today and the way that people are reacting, I honestly believe there's so much anger in the world right now that a lot of that anger has been driven through this underlying fear of, in people's lives. And I want to say this to you today, as believers in Jesus, and I'm not going to talk to you today as you talk to the world, but I'm going to talk to you today as men and women of God. We do not need to live in a place where fear dominates our lives. And so I want to give you some keys today on actually how to break through fear. Now, I'm going to tell you this, I have learned how to break through fear. If you were to say to me when I was 16 years old that I'd be preaching in front of a group of people, I would say, no way. I was so insecure as a kid. I was so fearful as a kid. I was the type of kid that if you saw me in high school and if you looked at me, if you gave me a glancing look, I would immediately think that you had a problem with me and I'd be freaking out and I'd be all insecure and fearful. And just the fact that I'm in ministry today, praise God, I've just made a determination that I'm not going to bow to that fear. And the reality is this, church, is that right throughout the Word of God, you will see men and women of God that were in very significant, fearful situations, but they continued to do what God had called them to do. You look at the apostles, and I, I didn't give the, 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 the guys this particular passage, but Acts chapter 29, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 4, verse 29, where the apostles are praying, they're believing for the Holy Spirit to come. They say, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God, of God boldly. Let me just say this. When you get filled with the Spirit of God, it's not just about making you feel good, but there is something that happens in your life that fills your life with great boldness. And the reality is they needed boldness. Because inside of their life, they were freaking out amongst everything that God had asked them to do. I think one of the big differences between the Old and the New Testament is when we read the Old Testament, we think of you know, people like Joshua and Moses and, and Gideon, all these great men of God. And then you go to the New Testament and you look at the 12 apostles and they're people just like you and me. Ordinary tradespeople. And yet God uses them well beyond their natural capacity to do phenomenal things and change the world inside and out, there is something about the Holy Spirit that comes upon us that makes us not bow to the natural fears of our lives. And so God doesn't promise us an absence of fear, but he does promise us how to overcome those fears in our lives. The classic passage in 2 Timothy 1 verse 6 to 7 is the classic one on dealing with fear. And the NIV puts it as a spirit of timidity. And Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says this, For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God, for the Spirit that God gave us does not make us timid. Everyone say timid. But as gives us power, love, and self-discipline. You know, I think often as believers, we often get this passage wrong, or we interpret it only with one angle. When we look at this passage, we often look at what God hasn't given us. We say, well, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. But we actually fail to see what God has given us. And if you often look at the things that God hasn't given you, you fail to recognize what God has given you. 
Yes, he has not given us a spirit of fear. But at the same time, he has given us his Holy Spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the spirit that lives in you and I. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, you've got to stoke that up. You've got to believe God for that. You've got to believe that your natural timidity, I honestly believe, and that's what I was saying before, that I'm speaking to you as men and women of God, not people of the world. Because whenever God asks us to do something, there's something about our natural timidity that immediately rises up. And I think this is what Paul is saying to Timothy. Because he's not talking to Timothy about leading a normal life. He's talking to Timothy about doing the things that God has asked him to do that require boldness, that require faith, that require a sense of confidence. And Paul comes to Timothy and he says, listen, Timothy, I know that naturally there is certain timidity in you. Come on, who knows that whenever the Holy Spirit asks you to do something, you are immediately battling this natural timidity. This sense within you that says, mm, I don't know whether I should do that. You know, it's funny, over the COVID period, I was talking to a couple in our church, a very, you know, a, a very a professional couple. They were high up in their jobs. And I think the, the, the husband had just lost his job and the wife was high up in a HR company. She was one of the directors. And she just felt to give that up. She just felt the Holy Spirit say, I want you to trust me. That season's come to an end in your life. I'm going to open up a new door. And so she was coming to me and she was telling me this story, but she was saying it to me as a sense of faith. And I'm listening to her and I'm thinking, what are you doing? I had timidity. She didn't, which is really bad as a senior pastor. But I'm going, okay, I can help you get another job and we've got another HR consultant and we can kind of sort things out. We can help you do this and do that. She goes, Matt, she goes, I'm doing what God has called me to do. There's often a natural timidity within us when the Holy Spirit is asking us to do certain things. I remember the very first time I ever got to preach in another church. We'd just taken over the Young Adults of Paradise. And uh, I was invited to do a church in Perth. And uh, they, they'd asked me to come, and it was a large youth group, probably the largest crowd I'd ever was going to speak in at that stage of my life. And uh, I remember being filled with so much timidity, and I started to fast and pray, and I said, Holy Spirit, I want to move in the prophetic and I want to move in the spiritual gifts and God, will you give me that gift and will you help me move in power? Anyway, I flew over to Perth and as I was flying over, I felt the Holy Spirit say, he said, I'm going to give you that gift, man. I'm going to make you move in the prophetic. I want you to be open to my voice. And so I remember the very first meeting I arrived, it was about an hour before the meeting and that night there was about a thousand kids in one of the gymnasium auditoriums. It was absolutely packed out. And everyone was excited and ready for a move of God. And, and during the praise and worship, I began to speak to the Holy Spirit. I said, all right, Holy Spirit, give me a word for someone. He said, not yet. I said, okay. During the offering, as they get up doing the offering, I began to say, Holy Spirit, give me a word for someone. He said, not yet. They invited me to come and preach at their pulpit as I get up and I'm about to preach. I'm saying, Holy Spirit, come on. I want to break this meeting open. Give me a word for someone. He said, okay. He said, you see that girl in the back row? I said, yes. He said, I want you to pull her out the front. I'm going to give her a word. I said, what's the word? He said, I'll tell you when she comes out to the front. <laughs> Instantly, there's a timidity, isn't there? There's this sense, I don't know whether I want to do this. I want to have it all planned out. I want to have it all secure. Holy Spirit, I could feel this urging. Come on, who knows when the Spirit of God speaks to you about it? There's an urging. There's a pushing. There's a driving to make you go beyond your natural abilities. This is, I think, what Paul is talking to Timothy about. So I took a step of faith. I got her out the front. She's looking around. I'm pointing at her. She's coming out the front. She's standing there. I lay my hands upon her. I said, all right, Holy Spirit, give me the word. Holy Spirit said, I want you to tell her that I love her. I said, now that's cool, but that's it? Like, can't you give me something more dramatic? Like what she had for breakfast that morning? Maybe what her grandmother's name? Some freaky stuff that is going to blow people's minds? You just tell her that I love her. Just be obedient. Again, this push. So the Holy Spirit says, God says that he loves you. Amen. 
You can go grab a seat. I went, that was a fizzer. So I kept preaching, got to the end of it. Who knows that when you're obedient to the Holy Spirit, he knows a lot more than what you know. Got to the end, a friend came up to me at the end of the meeting and she goes, that was amazing. I said, really? She goes, that was incredible. I said, why is that? She goes, well, that's my unsaved friend who I brought for the very first time to this meeting, to a church meeting. And my friend turns to me, whispers me during the praise and worship and says, if your God is really real, I want to hear the voice of God saying that he loves me. And I just began to think about how this natural timidity can hold us back from actually pushing through into the places that God wants to speak to us about. And so I want to speak to you to that. Now I want to look at two examples in the Old and the New Testament that will help you and I deal with fear in our lives. The first one is over two generations. And it's the classic one of Israel arriving into the promised land. And after all they'd gone through, all the plagues and the desert, the first generation arrived, and so they send the spies out, and because of the report that they came back with, the Bible says that they completely missed it, Moses' generation, of walking to the promised land. But I want to have a quick look at this. Numbers 13, verse 26 to 33. We're going to read a bit of the Word today. Is that all right? Come on, who loves the Word of God? There's nothing like the Word of God. It says this, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israel, Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which he sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit, but the people who live there are very powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anakdin, the Amalekites, live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up, take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Praise God for the Caleb's in the world. Amen? Amen. But the men who had gone up with him, they said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there and the descendants of Anak come from Nephilim. Listen to this. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Not in their eyes, in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. They were filled with fear. And in that fear, it was debilitating. Church, there is a debilitating fear that makes things bigger than what they are. The issue with that type of fear, and, and I think when you think about the results of fear or the effects of fear, is that those types of fear actually make you miss the moment, miss the opportunity, miss that moment where God wants to bring breakthrough in your life. The Bible says that they gave a bad report. That literally means in the Hebrew, it means a slanderous report, a baseless report. Church, it was baseless fear. It had no value. And I would say this to you today, that it was a fear that was a reflection of their own lack of faith. It was a fear that was reflecting their struggles, and their insecurities. You know, a few weeks ago, we were in, in Noosa. We took a holiday. And after 28 years of marriage, it was our first holiday without our kids. Praise God. Now, I love my kids. love going on holidays with them. But there's nothing, about go, there's nothing like being on holidays with the bride of your youth. See, man, that was the opportunity. <laughs> and there was Silence. Let me try that again. There's nothing like being on holidays with the bride of your youth. You have redeemed yourself. Yes. I'll be ready then too. And there we are. And we're out and we've got the hotel room and we're loving it and it's fantastic and long coffees in the morning. And I remember one, I remember one night where... We go to bed, and uh, 
you know, the, 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 the hotel room that we're at, it had the mirror on the outside. And so from the, the room to the, the toilet and the ensuite, the mirror wasn't on the inside, the mirror was on the outside of the door. And so you could see the mirror from where you were lying in bed. And so we went to bed that night and I must have drunk too many cups of tea. We'd closed the door and we went to bed and, and I woke about two o'clock in the morning and I got up to go to the toilet. And as I went to the toilet, I saw another man walking towards me. And I completely freaked out. Now, mind you, a very good looking man. And I went, ah! And the guy on the other side went, ah! And I realized it was my reflection. My wife instantly knows what's going on. Wakes up and goes, it's a mirror, you dummy, and went straight back to sleep again. And here I was freaking out at the reflection of myself. It's interesting that they say we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. They had created a narrative that was actually not the truth. If we now go to the second generation, and we say to ourselves, well, was that fear justified? Their, their, their fearfulness of these big anic people and the Nephilim and all that was going on, was it justified? We now go to Joshua generation. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. And again, they arrived at the same place that Moses' generation had arrived at. And it says, then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. And says, go look over the land, he said, especially to Jericho. And so they went and they entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. And the king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. And so the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. The women who had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me but I did not know where they'd come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she'd taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of the flax she'd laid out on the roof. And so the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and she said, I know that the Lord has given you this land and there is great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting with fear because of you. We've heard how the Lord had dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and when you did go to Shion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, eats of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, listen, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear. And everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and the earth below. Church, they were freaking out. The Israelites were freaking out. Everyone was freaking out. And nothing was happening. And behind the wall, behind the place that they did not see, and how they had this aberration of this huge monster, this difficult challenge, this overwhelming situation, the reality was on the other side of that, they were weak and insipid people. And I just began to think about that. That when it comes to fear in our lives, our ability to make it bigger than what it actually is, when in reality it is baseless because the Lord our God is with us. The Bible says that the enemy walks around like a roaring lion. He actually isn't a roaring lion. He creates an aberration. He creates a perception. He creates something that is just not there. I've been amazed that even over the COVID season in Melbourne, how people have tried to predict about what's going on, have caught themselves in so much fear and so much concern. Let me just say this, governments may come and go, plagues may come and go, but God is still on the throne. And as believers in Jesus, we understand that he's the one who holds our future in his hand. We didn't need to worry about the world. Maybe today on the other side of your wall, 
Maybe there's a whole bunch of stuff that is freaking you out. I want to say this to you today. Let the Word of God be an encouragement and also a place of wisdom for you and I. Think about one generation was stopped because their perception was false about what was on the other side of that war. It's so easy. We get, fear, we get fearful when we can't see into the future. And so our first response to uncertainty is fear. Maybe it's worse than what I expected. Maybe it's bigger than what I expected. Maybe it's too much than what I expected. The New Testament of example of fear is something that God spoke to me about just a few months ago. And I just thought it was really, really, really cool. And it's at the birth of Jesus. And Joseph is told by the Lord to go back to Israel. And it says this in Matthew chapter 2, verse 19 to 23. It said, after Herod, Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. And so he got up and he took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Achaelius was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. He went and he lived in a town called Nazareth. And so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. In other words, he arrived at this place that God had spoken to about. He heard that Herod's son, which was worse than his father, was there. So he was afraid to go there. It freaked him out. And so as a result of that, the Bible said that he withdrew. But listen, church, he withdrew to the very place that God had already attended for his life. I think this is powerful. It's powerful because Joseph's fear didn't diminish the power of God in his life. But God even used the fear of Joseph to fulfill the plan where Jesus would be raised up. And I would say this to you today. God will use your fears. He will use your faith. He, he is bigger than your fears. He is bigger than your fears to outwork his plan and his purpose in your life. And my encouragement to you this morning is don't let the enemy diminish your faith because of fear. I have a phrase that I often use in my own life. Don't fear Fear. Don't fear fear. God, I've been fearful about this situation. Maybe I'm stepping into plan B of what God has for me. Ah, that's wrong. God is bigger than your fears. God is bigger than your concerns. God is bigger than the moments that you freak out. Look at Acts in the New Testament with the apostles. God will still fulfill his plan and his purpose in your life if you continually come to him and put your faith in him. Yeah. Listen to this, church. When you don't fear fear, it breaks its power and its hold over your life. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray for three things. Number one, I want to pray that maybe today you're facing the unknown. I want to encourage you today that the Holy Spirit's going to go before you. Maybe today you've made a bigger issue out of something than what is really there. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will bring it back into its rightful place. Maybe today you're stuck because of fear. I pray that the Holy Spirit this morning is going to loosen that to keep you moving forward again. Yes, there is a timidity. We all live with a timidity. But I want to say this to you, church. I don't want to live as a normal person on this earth with my maybe my 80 or 90 years. I want to do what the Holy Spirit has asked me to do. And there's always a conflict. And there's always a stretch. And there's always a challenge. We're always going to be timid. Every time I get up to preach, I'm timid. Every time I move in the word of prophecy, I'm timid. But I've just made a decision. I'm not going to bow to that. The third one is this, or the fourth one is this. Maybe you faced fear and the enemy has said you've missed it because of that fear. But like Joseph, the Holy Spirit is still going to direct you. He's still going to bring you to that place where God is going to bring breakthrough in your life. 
Can I pray for you this morning? Come on, I want you to stand your feet. I want the musicians to come. Whatever you're facing, whatever challenges you're dealing with right now, maybe today you are stuck because of fear. Maybe today it has been a season of fear and there's been a sense in you, am I really fulfilling what God has asked me to do? Maybe today there's just a pattern of always catastrophizing everything that happens in your life. I want to pray today that God will put fear in its rightful place. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want you to just bow your heads and the musicians come up. Thank you, Spirit of God. We honor you today. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come on, lift your hands to heaven right now. Father, we worship you. God, we worship you this morning, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We honor you today. We worship you today. We thank you today, Lord Jesus. We thank you, God, today for your power. We thank you, Holy Spirit, today for your anointing. We thank you, God, today. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Today, if any of those four things apply to you and you say, I want prayer today, can you just come and get out of your seat? Just come and stand in the front. We're going to pray for you this morning. Come on, there are people here today. Why don't you come? Maybe today you are facing a sickness. You know, maybe today it's just bigger. You've just made it bigger than what it actually is. Maybe today you're stuck because of fear today. Maybe today it's really got a hole in your life today. Maybe I'm asking you to do something that probably increases that fear, but I'm going to pray today that the Holy Spirit will bring breakthrough today. Come on, there are other people here today. Maybe it's for some of you today, there's a fear of the loss of your job and your finances. And that has really gripped your life. And you know what? It's just, you've just made it bigger than what it is. The Holy Spirit just wants to come and just put, the, put it back into its right perspective. Some of you here today, and you know, you, 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 at times you have been directed by fear and God wants to give you a revelation today that even though that's happened, He's still going to direct your life. He's still going to bring you to that place that He's always planned for you today. Holy Spirit, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus. In the name that is above every name, we thank you, Spirit of God, for your power today. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your anointing today. We take authority over debilitating fear in Jesus' name. We break that right now in the name of Jesus. The name that is above every name. God, we speak your power over every situation. We speak your authority over every situation in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I want the pastors to come and be, people begin to pray. I'm going to pray that today is just a line in the sand. Holy Spirit, we thank you today in Jesus' name. Oh, come on, church. Why don't you reach out your hands to these wonderful people right now. Spirit of God, we speak your blessing today. And your favor today. And your anointing today. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Spirit of God. Greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. Holy Spirit, just come right now. God, and bring your favour today. God, bring your anointing today. God, bring your power today. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. God, we worship you, Lord Jesus. Oh, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father God. God, we thank you, God, that you are so good. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you hold our future in your hand. We thank you, Father God, that we don't need to worry about the future, but we honour you today. We worship you today. Come on, let's begin to worship you. Thank you, God. This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Come on, lift your hands this morning. Where every demon trembles. Thank you. Where we proclaim your name. This is a house of healing. Our hearts are full of faith. You have our full attention. 
Come alive, so come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. This resurrection. Your blood runs through our veins. Your kingdom triumphs over. Even the coldest graves. Yeah. So come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is. To the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. So come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus, everything. In the name of Jesus, this is a house of miracles. I still believe you're moving. I still believe you're speaking. God, I believe you're working. All things are good. I love this next part. I fix my eyes on heaven. God, I receive your vision. God, I believe. You know, before I go, I've got to go to the next service, but I do want to pray for people this morning and I won't get you to come out the front, but I will get you to raise your hands. But maybe God is asking you to do something in faith. I believe in this season, the church should be bolder than ever before. Where people are reversing and people are retreating and people are backing off. This is an opportunity for men and women of faith to rise up. And not to go the way the world is going, but to actually push forward in the name of Jesus. You think about during the Roman Empire, how the whole Jewish community was freaking out and how they were kind of contained in their little places and spaces. And yet here is the church under such rule and restriction. It is exploding because men and women of faith chose not to bow to their fear, but allow the Holy Spirit to fill their life with boldness. And I want us to pray today. You know, the world says, help me overcome fear. But the church will be saying, God, let us, let us seize the hour to do what you've asked us to do. So I want us to pray.